So I'm back with my last minute tips. Right, further organic chem. You have got to expect that this will come up. The main thing here, remember, is the manufacture of esters. So to make esters, you need a sulfuric acid catalyst. It's a reversible reaction. That's what that arrow there means. And you'll need to remember that it's a condensation reaction. Which, if they ask you what that means, it involves the loss of water. To make an ester, you need an alcohol. You need a carboxylic acid. There's your reversible arrow. You'll produce your ester and that water molecule I just mentioned. Do make sure you can identify the functional groups for all these homologous series. There's the alcohol functional group. There's the carboxylic acid functional group. And there's the ester. So be prepared to see it written like this on a displayed formula. Do make sure you can remember the naming convention where esters are concerned. So for example, if I were to take methanol and I react it with ethanoic acid, to name the ester, the start of the ester's name must come from the alcohol. So in this case, the name of the ester formed is methyl ethanoate plus water. I'll quickly draw the displayed formula for this. There's methanol. Here's ethanoic acid. You're going to lose a water molecule. The H comes from the alcohol. The OH comes from the carboxylic acid. So to draw your ester, you'll need to draw something like this. Be very careful with how you draw it. So in terms of circling the functional groups, there's your alcohol functional group, there's your carboxylic acid functional group, and there's your ester functional group. Obviously, polyesters are also important, but I want you to watch my all-in-one video or my further organic chem video in order to understand that. After all, this is a last minute tips. Don't forget that carboxylic acids react in the same way as all acids. So for example, they react with metals to form a salt plus hydrogen. So just to show you that, here's methanoic acid. Let's react it with calcium. Be very, very careful with your balancing here. It's very important that you get those ions correct. This is very intense chem that I'm doing right now, so please don't stress if you're not entirely sure what's going on. This is really for grade nine people. If I were to take a carboxylic acid and react it with a metal carbonate, for example, you'd produce a salt plus water plus carbon dioxide. So here's ethanoic acid as an example. Here's calcium carbonate. Again, drawing that super carefully. And then make sure it's balanced. Remember, with the oxidation of alcohols, you've got microbial oxidation. So that's just using microorganisms in the air. You've got complete combustion, which remember means burning in a plentiful supply of oxygen, or you've got heating in potassium dichromate 6 under reflux using a sulfuric acid catalyst. And here you'll see a color change of orange to green. That tends to be the oxidation of alcohols people don't remember. Do remember to look over the different ways in which you can make alcohols. So that will be fermentation versus hydration of ethene. In terms of comparisons, remember fermentation requires anaerobic conditions, so conditions lacking in oxygen to force the yeast to anaerobically respire to convert that glucose to ethanol 
and carbon dioxide. It's a slow rate of reaction. It produces impure alcohol and it's a batch process. Hydration of ethene involves a phosphoric acid catalyst. It's a continuous process. It has a high rate of reaction and it produces pure ethanol. Remember the renewability of the resource. Because this comes from sugarcane, it's renewable. Because this comes from crude oil, it's non-renewable. What about electrolysis? Just remember for me that the electrolyte, the substance undergoing electrolysis, must be molten or an aqueous solution. Why is that? So that the ions are free to move. Remember that at the cathode, that's the negative electrode, you'll have positive ions attracted and they are called cations. So just to show you, for example, you could have hydrogen forming hydrogen gas. Make sure you can balance that half equation by adding electrons. Because electrons have been added, you might be asked to identify the fact that this is reduction. At the anode, which is the positive electrode, you're gonna have negative ions attracted which are known as anions. So for example, this sort of reaction, and because we're losing electrons, that's an oxidation reaction. If you're asked about an aqueous substance such as aqueous sodium chloride, it becomes more difficult because we have lots of ions present in solution. We have H plus and OH minus indicated by aqueous, then sodium and chloride ions. So at that positive electrode, at the anode, you have to pick between these two ions and it will always be the halogen, which is attracted preferentially. So again, that's the equation we need here. That's oxidation. At the negative electrode, so at the cathode, you'll have to pick between these two ions. And remember, it's going to be hydrogen that discharges because it's less reactive than sodium. So that's your rule at the negative electrode. And here we can see reduction occurring. If they ask you what the electrodes are made out of, they're often made from either platinum or graphite. Why? Because they are unreactive and they conduct electricity. Making salts often gets ignored. Try and use your common sense here. If you're asked to make a soluble salt from an insoluble reactant, look at state symbols, look at the wording in the question. It therefore makes sense that you add reactants to a beaker. You're gonna stir them. You want your insoluble reactant, so the one that doesn't dissolve, to be in excess. And because it's in excess, you need to remove it. And because it's insoluble, the neatest way to do that is to filter it. And then we go straight for the heating in an evaporating basin. Why? To evaporate some of the water. And then we want to allow to cool. And we want to leave to dry. Make sure you specify the drying conditions in a drying oven is a good idea here. So that's how you make a soluble salt, make sure you've learned your salt solubility rules using an insoluble reactant. But what about if I wanted to make an insoluble salt from two soluble reactants? So I'm gonna to have to use a different approach here. So I'm gonna mix my two soluble reactants so once I've mixed them together, I'll produce my insoluble salt, but there'll still be some reactants left over, so I want to filter 
and then I want to wash with water to remove any of the soluble reactants left. And then quite frankly, all I need to do is leave to dry in a drying oven. And then the toughest one really is making a soluble salt from an acid and alkali. Remember an alkali is a soluble base and this is where you use your titration method. The reason why you need to use the titration method is it allows you to find out the exact volumes of your acid and alkali to use. So you carry out a titration with an indicator so that you know that exact point of neutralization, but then you have to repeat the whole thing, but this time without the indicator, because you don't want that getting involved with your salt that you're trying to make. And then you can go straight into the first set of method marks that I pointed out. So you want to heat to evaporate some of the water because you want a hydrated salt you want to leave to cool and you want to leave to dry. So you can see the first and third method are quite similar. The difference is when you have an acid and alkali, you need to do a titration first to find the exact volumes of acid and alkali needed. If you're not sure, just say something about drying in a drying oven, okay? Just to get a mark there and, and talk about mixing the reactants together. With that titration, remember that is a paper two topic, so say stuff to do with whether you're washing, you know, that you're washing the burette with the solution being used, you wash the conical flask with water, you add just a few drops of indicator to the conical flask, make sure you're using an indicator that has a sharp colour change, which is why universal indicator is inappropriate, use a white tile, swell the flask, so get that perfect method nailed down please remember my revision guide is full of those sorts of points the last thing I want to touch on is dynamic equilibrium again this is a last minute video so I can't go too much into it but if you're told that the reaction has a negative delta H remember that means it's exothermic which means it gets hot so to increase the yield of products in this situation you want to decrease the temperature. Why? Because it shifts the position of equilibrium to the right. If you have this situation, for example, in the harbour process where you're making ammonia, again, the forward reaction is exothermic. So yes, we would want to lower the temperature to increase the yield of ammonia. But what about pressure? What you have to do here is count the number of moles of gas on each side of the equation. One plus three is four. Here's two moles. So to increase the yield of ammonia, what you need to do in terms of pressure is increase the pressure. Why? Because the position of equilibrium shifts to the right because there are fewer moles of gas on the right-hand side. Again, do watch my all-in-one videos, my dynamic equilibrium specific videos because this is hard chemistry.